I guess Nick and I can also teach you guys a bit about how to tag team parent when uh, you don't have any family on the same side of the world and you have to bring your three-year-old to a conference. <laughs> but um, I feel a little bit odd being up here. I'm not a designer. I don't teach design. My students aren't designers. And some of them, I would say, are not even that interested in sustainability. <laughs> so, so what am I doing here? So Norway has just recently had a very big education reform. Um, and this reform is very encompassing. It uh, is enacted from all levels of what they call grunnutdanning in Norway, your compulsory and secondary education. So from kindergarten until we get to upper secondary school, this reform is binding. And I teach a group of teachers who struggle with curriculum reform to start with and who struggle with sustainability. That's vocational teachers, irkesfag in Norwegian. Um, so these are teachers that are teaching in subjects like plumbing, uh, building sciences, foot therapy, uh, beauty industry, healthcare, these kind of uh, industries that are not necessarily connected to an academic pathway, but are, that, but are closely aligned in many cases with manufacture and with a practice field. So they face a lot of challenges, the teachers that um, I have in my course. Um, and so what I thought I'd talk to you guys to about um, today is how we look at working with their mindsets and their attitudes towards sustainability and ha how we work with how they can incorporate sustainability that makes sense to their industries into their own curriculums. Um, I'll just come down here. And I also apologize if I apologize if I break out coughing in the middle of this. I've been very sick for the last couple of weeks. So, vocational education and design is a little bit closer than what you might necessarily think at the start of it. Um, they're both the practice-based pedagogy, very closely aligned either to workshop or um, to in a healthcare setting for some of them, or in a clinic, or in a workshop on a building site. Um, it's outside of theoretical education, I would say. Um, they're very closely aligned to production processes, to the commercial field as well. So commercial actors and interests play a big part in both my students, who are all active teachers in full-time work in their institutions, and their students, their pupils, if you, for want of a better word, who are going to go out into apprenticeships in, um, in their, each of their fields. And it's a field of practice, as I said, uh, separate to traditional academic knowledge, and a lot of it is based around project uh, learning. So this course that I teach is new uh, at Oslo Met and in Norway in generally. Um, it's called Deep Knowledge and Sustainability in Your Own Profession. So you set the agenda of what you want to deepen your knowledge in and how you want to apply this to your own profession. So I'm there officially as the lecturer. Um, I'm an anthropologist. I have a background in science and technology studies and an interest in the Anthropocene. I've researched industrial landscapes with beekeepers, new forms of dementia care, prosthetics industries, these kind of things. But I'm not in any way a vocational teacher myself. And the goal of this course, uh, the course that I teach is not necessarily um, that I should master the, each of the fields that my students are in, nor that they should become more anthropologically aware. So for the most part, I would say the students that come are confused, stressed, like a lot of what I've heard uh, you guys talk about today. How, what does this mean in practice? OK, we're all preaching to the converted here a little bit. We, we believe in transition design. We believe the world needs to be more sustainable, both from in terms of manufacture and in terms of our own behaviors 
and in terms of how we front that message out to our stakeholders. But what does that mean if I'm standing there in my classroom with a bunch of 17-year-olds who are going to become auto mechanics? How am I going to, you know, like, meet them where they are? That's a, a concrete question that one of my students came up to me, you know, like, like how, how does this relate to both my students' world views and their pupils' world views? So they are already above interested in sustainability, I would say. Or, and I would say that this refers to about a third of my students, they have no interest in sustainability whatsoever. And their boss, at some level, has said, you have to increase your competence in this area, go and take this course. So I have both the very much on board from the beginning and those that are with their hand behind their back being pushed along into it. So how do I meet those guys where they are? The course is entirely autonomous and entirely asynchronous. The students are all adult learners. Most of them have been in their job for at least 12, 15 years, doing the same thing year after year after year. But they are all in the process of integrating an entirely new subject curriculum into their classroom. So they're, I would say, quite stressed about it. So this is the, the Reform Act that I, I just mentioned. And it has this line uh, in the new um, first paragraph of the education law in Norway, which is pretty impressive as a nat nat national curriculum. The pupils and apprentices must learn to think critically and act ethically and with environmental awareness. They have joint responsibility and the right to participate in society. And that's a translation into English. It's even actually stronger in Norwegian. It says they must have med virknad and med ansvar. The, the right to participate, the, the, they are forced to think uh, in terms of participatory democracy and participatory responsibility. It goes further, this uh, education reform, um, and puts a heavy emphasis on critical and systems-based thinking, which is also problematic, as I'm going to get to inside the classroom, um, deep learning and ethics. So <coughs> while the, the, this introductory paragraph to the, to the Norwegian curriculum law is pretty clear, you know, you're going to have to learn about uh, environmental sustainability. These three, there are three cross-disciplinary themes. Um, sustainable development, uh, participatory democracy, and um, mangfold. Plurality. Plurality, yeah, multiculturalism. Multi um, and leaves mastering and folk health. Uh, uh, public health and your ability to master your own life, I would say. Livsmestering is quite an interesting uh, Norwegian concept, I find. Life mastery. So once we come down from this overarching uh, education reform, which has been really ambitious, how each subject might integrate uh, each one of these themes into their own, sub uh, own subject area is pretty much left up to each individual teacher. So that means that those that are really invested in it have the possibility to go forth and, and you know, do what they wish, really. But for the vast majority of them, they don't see how these three big social dilemmas that are then mentioned in that curriculum reform can be integrated. So these, the problems are, for example, it leads to fragmentation. Um, and what it often leads to is stunts at school. Uh, sustainability week, uh, fashion swap. Activities that take place over and above what the standard curriculum is. And then increase the workload of both the teachers that are integrating these um, new events and pupils who are pretty much already overworked to start with. 
So if we are considering that sustainability is something to be added on top of an already existing workload, we're failing. So rather than thinking of each discipline as having its own boundaries that sustainability then has to be imposed upon, what I suggest to the students that we do and what I do through my course is that sustainability forms the framework of what we operate within their own subjects within. Pupils aren't idiots either, and through these stunts, a lot of them see contradictions where they're apparent. Nothing like taking your whole bunch of students down to the beach to do like a seafront cleanup and then having plastic cutlery in your <laughs> canteen still. Even more so after COVID. They're not stupid. They uh, see their teachers and their schools as a practice arena for society. Um, and just, uh, this is mostly aimed at my Norwegian colleagues that are here today. The struggle to integrate sustainability <coughs> is real. It's very apparent in Norwegian literature that has come out since the uh, reform. Uh, the top one is sustainable development, multidisciplinarity, um, and in-depth learning, how to change big ideas into uh, no Norwegian context. context. What... Uh, Promotes and hinders work with, ex work with the sustainable development in your Norwegian schools. Uh, Multidisciplinary integration of sustainability as a challenge. Um, it's how this one especially, new one this last year, how to give uh, meaning to frustration and complexity. And this one I find, um, anyone who speaks Norwegian that's here today, uh, the problem of scale in education for sustainability um, is a big issue. How do we meet pupils in whatever subject that we want, where they are, and bring these global challenges that we've heard a lot from, from Terry and from um, uh, Clara, who was here somewhere, I saw. Um, how we bring those global challenges with global stakeholders and wicked problems to a level that a 16-year-old can understand in the building trade. How, how is that possible to do? And so I used um, a chaos pilot tool called Learning Arch Design. I don't know if you guys, uh, some of you will have heard of chaos pilots in Aarhus. But um, I find that this design methodology works very much for how I run my course in terms of sustainability and how my teachers then go on to encourage an autonomous learning journey for their pupils. So here we have, it's in Norwegian again, my apologies. Um, the need for input from me should decrease over time. The complexity of the material that they deal with should also be able to increase over time. They go from a period where they learn about what the issue is, and here they are required to do um, internships out in industry, um, to where they learn to um, handle, act, act uh, and how they learn to unvend, uh, unvend or to um, apply their knowledge into the classroom. So. For each one of my students, this sustainability journey looks quite different, but the end of their course um, is that they'll perform some action-based research within their own classroom. Together with the students, they'll co-create an element of their own curriculum that will have a sustainable uh, agenda. And for each of them, that looks really different. Some of them run school debates or as to whether in their foot therapy clinic they'll be using one-off paper um, towels that are loca uh, manufactured locally or import cotton towels that are reusable but maybe manufactured in India. And each of these students, each of their own pupils will, you know, like go their own sustainable journey to look into the issues of manufacture and green supply for, um, that, that, that makes sense for them. Some of my Students in the building trades look at how 
We might reuse building materials, which is not as easy as it sounds, because if you're going to reuse building materials, recycle and reuse building materials, you need to have a system for certification. Are those building materials equal to new ones? Uh, what can they be used for? How can they be sold? How can the validity of them be certified? If there are no people capable of doing that, then we've got, again, a system-based problem. Might, it's fine if I want to personally, in my own house that I'm building, use a second-hand door. But as an industry, that doesn't quite cut it. So they, they look into all sorts of uh, things, but my um, role in this is to open up that space and to allow them to play with the theme of sustainability. School is a practice arena for society. They bring their internships, bring together local social actors. They bring together leadership in the school because without an anchoring inside the leadership, they won't be able to move forward from an individual um, level. It's very interesting to me that we talk, I've heard a lot of talk about stakeholders here because a lot of the stakeholders in this um, program that is uh, designed are already on board. Uh, local level governments are already on board. Schools are forced to be on board by the education reform whether they want to or not. Um, and that, to a certain extent, exempts my students from having to think about like, is this something that I really care about or not? It doesn't matter. It's in the law. You just got to teach it. You know? And so when we look and take a step back at the, the Gr European Green Deal that we've talked about, I can always swing that agenda to my students who are so close to the field of practice by saying that it doesn't really matter how on board you are with the environmental aspect of this because the European Green Deal will mean that if you want to remain a competi competitive business, if you want to um, be able to compete in the European market, you'll need to take sustainability seriously, whether or not you value degrowth, whether or not you, devalue, you evaluate and are concerned about um, social rights and social justices. So I have all these small ways in which that I, I can sort of encourage action and through action and through seeing what their fellow students do, even those that weren't really maybe on board at the start of this course, I find come to it by the end. But the other thing that I would say is it's a one-year course and so much of this like what we talk about today and what we've talked about um, both in my course in transition design in general is to do with mindsets holding and attitudes and changes in behavior. And I won't be able to accomplish that within a year. Like it takes time to think new thoughts and we're always in such a hurry. So one of the big things that I, I think that I, I bring to this teaching is actually a message that I got through the PDC permaculture design certificate and that's to to understand that the, the, this new way of thinking holistically that, that Terry talks about, that Cameron talks about, it takes time and it is a process. And I think that we need to really respect so that people will always be in a different loop in that process to what we are in ourselves. So the best that we can really do is be a role model and to say that we don't have all the answers. In fact, in lots of cases, we don't have any of the answers. But we can approach it with like the possibility to fail, even though the, the consequences of us failing constantly are quite dire. But we have to like allow space for new people coming on board that aren't necessarily already within a transition design mindset, within an anthropological Anthropocene mindset. We have to allow space for those people to to grow that mindset within a very short amount of time. These things, I mean, so for some of us, this process of coming to transition design, or in my case, coming to multi-species anthropology, has taken my entire academic career, and I'm trying to condense it into one year for, like, car mechanics. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, uh, 
I, I think like allowing time is really, really important. Um, so th these are, I was just thinking some of the things that you guys might be interested in. Um, I know that Terry mentioned Schumacher School and Stephen Sterling, if you haven't read him. It's a very small book, this top one. Um, super important in terms of uh, education and sustainability, if any of you guys are going to go that route. Um, new one, which is a, uh, a new one um, here from 2021 from Davila, uh, Davila, Davila, I think her name is, um, looking at how we might uh, um, add uh, Donella Meadows' deep leverage uh, points into education um, and a couple of other ones to do with uh, vocational training. But that is pretty much what I came to you guys to say. What makes it work? The students love this course. Um, when I changed it from being an in-person course to being online and being autonomous, that students would have to take responsibility essentially for their own um, learning journeys. Meeting them where they are and at what stage they're at in their lives is super important. And allowing them as well to understand their own journey. Um, their exam at the end of that year is essentially a repeat question of their first assignment. And it's a very open assignment, which basically is, what is sustainability for me? And so at the end of the year, having gone through curriculum analysis, having gone through two rounds of internships and in businesses and other schools, having gone through peer evaluation of their own assignments, and actually, um, one thing I didn't mention about this course right at the start is that it's under contract from the Department of Education nationally. So a imposition that they place on me as the course holder is that there should be an element of competence increasing at workplace. So some of their assignments, they actually have to spread back out to their colleagues at work, which most of my students are quite terrified about because standing up to your whole school and then saying that, you know, like you're going to front sustainability at school is a little bit daunting. But just with that very first step in the very first meeting when they're talking to their colleagues about sustainability and how it might be implemented in the school, like it's such a giving process for them to understand that their colleagues come on board slowly but surely and that it becomes better anchored in the school system. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite amazing to read and watch because they do video deliveries to me, that growth that they have. Establishing a community of practice, um, super, super important because I think many of us uh, here, while we get together and we've all got similar ideas in our workplaces, we might be one of two, three people that are interested in sustainability, that are driven to put forth, you know, like a strong behavior based system change as opposed to just switching out LED lights and maybe putting in like a sort a rubbish sorting system. Um, keeping it very close to the field of practice that the, my students find themselves in and allowing any relationships that they build to be organic in nature. They might not, it's quite often in fact that when they submit assignments they don't actually match the brief of the assignment that I've set them in the classroom whatsoever but I would rather they establish a lasting contact that goes for more than one year. Uh, how many of our projects last for a year and they have great results and then afterwards no one takes ownership for them and they just fizzle out? Um, and I think uh, just being very honest that, that I don't have any of the answers at all. I'm muddling along, doing the very best that I can. Um, I think we all are. And that allowing that knowledge to permeate and that kind of like playful sense of having an open mind. So I think that's all I really wanted to come and share with you guys today. I'm very conscious of the fact that I was sort of sold into this conference as a bit of a two for one. So, no. <laughs> but I'm happy to take any questions because it's a bit of an oddball course. So anyway. <laughs> Thank you.
somebody else? Yeah, I was curious as to how school leaders react to, to this afterwards, that the teachers have been to, to this course, and how they react when they try to implement this in the workplace. Is it actually... Does it work? Yeah, does it work? They've all just delivered me their final assignments now, and I am super impressed at how they get it to work. Like, I'm, some of them would, you know, like they write to me about their, their last assignment, which is to do a, uh, a, a piece of development yeah, or a, like an um, action research in their own classroom. You know, like, some of them have implemented, like, um, leadership uh, changes, you know, like how, and, and establish, like, maybe a Grundelevrod, like a student body interested in sustainability in their own schools. Uh, some of them have now worked out new ways of, apprenticing students out to business and established um, uh, what's that? A, student, a student business, you know, like an entrepreneurial student business run through the school that maybe deals with a waste product or maybe encourages some sort of social integration. I think, it's, I think what the big part of the course is understanding what the social mandate of a school is. What, what do we think? What does a school do in society, right? What, uh, what's, it, what's it there for? And at the beginning of this course, many of the, uh, of the students would be like, oh, but I don't want to deal with sustainability because it's like, it's political. And I'm like, what's a school? It, it like educates burgere. It educates citizens. How much more political can it be? A, a school is a political organ, you know, like... So it doesn't really matter if, if uh, sustainability is a political issue. And, but I, I really think that um, they, they, they come over um, what I would call, what's it called in English? A, an agent of paralysis. Um, and that's like to understand how humbling uh, slummit, how, how your possibility to affect action is only really, it's diminished by what um, hindrances you see for yourself, right? Okay. So, okay. <laughs> 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 there, there were some other, other people. I can talk to you later. Okay. Sure. Okay, so. There's one more. Maybe there is. Oh, it was very similar. I was just wondering what surprises uh, uh, got. So there's so many surprises. Like, I have uh, one student who teaches uh, industrial slaughtering, you know, like uh, in the meat industry. And uh, when we started the course, he was almost having a bit of sort of like a life crisis. He said his, his children had become vegans and didn't want to talk to him anymore. And, you know, like, so how, how was he? He felt like his subject was, you know, the scapegoat for all sorts of environmental um, issues. But he actually... So he teaches inside industrial food manufacture. It's just that they have an emphasis on uh, the meat industry. And so he'd, you know, like, uh, one of his, his final s project there was getting, student, uh, getting his pupils involved in fermentation processes. So they had come out with a student, uh, a student uh, entrepreneurial business that created, like, kombucha and kimchi and, you know, like... Uh, all sorts of manufacturing processes that the students, the, the pupils, always need to know about. But like, if you swing your focus that way, you're not just dictated by what the market tells you you have to do. You have the possibility to form uh, those markets that you want for yourself. And so I, I think at the end of the course, I'd said to him, like, if he doesn't like the meat industry the way it is, or if he feels that it's a scrape, but what would the perfect meat industry look like to him? Would it be that they're able to produce a higher quality product that then means that they can sell it for higher money, so that means they can move away from, you know, like, whatever disgusting mashed up chicken products that they make to, like, some sort of whole, you know, like, if, if you don't like the industry you find yourself in, what can you do to like, well, how would it have to change for, in order for you to be happy with it?
That's I, that, and that's, I think, how all of my students in the end approach that course. Like, what can I do within my own profession? Or is my own profession still fit for purpose? You know, like, it, but, but, it, but it's something we forget, I think. Like, we forget it because we're all in the process of living our own lives, right? But in terms of vocations, in terms of all professions, in fact, there is always some professions that are dropping off the back end. How many, like, wagon makers do you still know? Uh, or, but, like, there are always new ones coming to take over them. And, and we've had some really interesting um, discussions in the classroom, actually. Do we still need a beauty industry at a vocational school level? Or is that level actually too low where we're just... Um, because if we know that a lot of the pupils will go on to take a nursing degree and become, like... Um, like a nurse who can administer facial treatments or stuff like that. Do we really need that really low level? Is it still fit for purpose? Like, I don't know the answer. Maybe it's yes, maybe it's not. But, like, it's interesting to have the discussion in the classroom. So, anyway. Sorry, my window. <laughs>